Discord is so loud. What the hell? I legitimately don't have Discord open on my computer and I don't know how to turn off the sound for it. It is so weird. Oh, don't have the logo either. Let's get into it. So y'all know this is a book club ting. It's gonna be big for a second. And now it's small. But as folks clamor in, we are getting into our discussion for part two of <sighs> the stars and the blackness between them. What an absolute beautiful read. Do I have my copy up here? I do. It's right behind my laptop. Sorry, y'all. Let's get into the lip gloss, though. But I absolutely, positively love 10 out of 10. If you are watching this replay a year, months later, two years later, multiple years later, I fully endorse whenever you have the chance. Picking this book up and either picking the physical copy up or getting the audiobook version of it, both are amazing, splendiferous. 10 out of 10, it was such a beautiful read. And also, um, we have an author chat coming up next week, February 3rd. I'm going to be late to a class for this author chat. So please submit your questions. The link is in the description bar or in the description box if you're watching on Facebook. It's in the description bar if you are watching on YouTube. Get into it, get into it, get into it because we need your questions. Sometimes I'll be feeling like, do y'all not like that book? What's tea? What's good? What's hood? Oh my gosh. And we should get into this a little bit, though. Let me see. Okay, yes. I want people to get into this cute syllabus that we produced for um, The Stars of My Blackness. Pick it up. It'll help you come up with some questions. Oh, that's for the last read. <laughs> that's the Office of the Historical Corrections. Wrong screen. Uh, let's see here. Here's a motif page for the stars and the blackness. Between them, we have magical realism, ancestral connection, care work. I love that. Astrology, healing, ethics of care, queer identity, blackness, pleasure, death, mass incarceration, friendship, alternative, medicines, therapy, spirituality, wildness, and Whitney Houston. This is all sewed into the book. And I know this might sound like a heavy read, but I promise you this read was super like, it dealt with heavy topics in such an enjoyable way that I really can't overstate how much I want to encourage people to get into the work that Winata produced. It is that book and she is joining us next week. I've heard from some members in the book club that it, like she is absolutely just a magical person herself. Oh, and I forgot to turn on my ring light. So I'm a little dark right now, aren't I? Hmm. I is. Let me turn on the ring light real quick. Sorry, y'all. I Turn it all the way up. What light is? Why am I in here? Look, it's so dark. Okay. We are here today. So I'm going to, as we do in all live discussions, we crack open the syllabus. Say hi if you're here. Let me know. Hopefully we get some comments as we go through this. But I would love to get some engagement. Especially y'all if coming from the Discord. Y'all be real quiet. Be no replies. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what else to do, y'all. I've been trying. Um, but I'm just going to crack open the syllabus. And we are going to start from um, page 155 to the ending, okay? And I absolutely do love how they did so, well, how Winata sewed um, astrology into this book without it being like over overdone. Um, each, and actually the astrology in the book allows you to know the progression of like how much time has passed and what season you're in. And then the poems, 
the poems for each season are just so beautiful. It's beautiful. Let me turn the page 155 in my book and read Scorpio season. I desire to see myself in the nocturne of me, night vision to look into my shadow, the secrets and shames of my daddy's DNA, his tears coming from a wetness deep inside that was all hid. My mama's womb is encrusted in rubies of calcified blood, heirlooms of mothers and grandmothers whom womb whose womb never got to belong to them. They sit with me so I can see the roots of things. A sacred death is the climax of life and all death is rebirth, a soul's portal into parts unknown. I deep dived into our ancestors, our, I deep dived to our ancestors Atlantis. They jump middle passage to immigrate underwater and accumulate wisdom from deep sea sages, wise and liquid intelligence when to flow, float and sink. I went underground. I grew an armor to protect my secrets and inner delicate. I was magic and ritual and communion and goddess and rain and Orisha and ancestor and fire and dirt. And, you know, when you think about that, this is a young adult book. I think a lot of this sort of the messaging in the book really encourages the young reader to go read more or to look up the things that they might not know of, especially within the poems. Um, like what is an Orisha? What what does she mean by these cultural elements? You know, especially if you know, obviously the child can only live in the world that their parent allows them to live in. So I imagine most children live in a very small world. But just be able to have that sort of like, you know, I feel like this book is very enlightening, and I'm a, I'm an adult, okay? I'm very much so grown here. So. I loved it. Yes, I agree. This was one of my favorite parts of how she tracked time via astrology. I felt like that was a very, just, it was a very genius setup. Okay, but we're going to get into the questions now. So if you have this syllabus, this is on page 21 in the syllabus. Um, but what do you think the dreamscapes from Queenie's perspective are meant to symbolize? Why is Mabel Axe given access to Queenie's earlier life and experiences of queerness? If we have any commenters here now. I was totally surprised by Mabel. And remember, Mabel is the young girl from Minneapolis. She's the one that ends up getting um, cancer. And Audrey is Queenie's granddaughter who is forcefully migrated from by her mother from Trinidad to live with her father in Minneapolis. And so I was, I was actually very surprised when it was Mabel who brings us back to Queenie's early years. And Queenie is such a powerful character in the book. I love everything about Queenie. Just that she's also very realistic. I definitely feel like, I mean, I definitely feel like the author, this is very much a real person in the author's life because just the humanness of this character was just so enjoyable. And I love this sort of pullback to a, a point that earlier in the book when Audrey is talking to Queenie is mentioned in passing how, you know, she knows all these people from the, her time in New York and trying to be a dancer. And she just has this like energy that just draws people in, but that Mabel is the one who brings us back to these memories that she has with a young Brazilian woman and they become hmm, something more than friends. And it really is just a beautiful retelling. And then Mabel makes the choice to not tell Queenie, not tell um, Audrey, I mean, um, which was an interesting choice. We definitely could talk about that more later. But I would love to hear what any of y'all thought was um, meant or symbolized by that. But I also, I think it just, it, it meant that like, the strength you can find in just being who you want to be and not being ashamed of who you are was definitely meant there. I think it's supposed to symbolize a larger African diaspora as a way to show how well connected we are, how we are all connected, even in the ancestral dream space. I 
I love that, you know, that the African-American child is the one who was visited by the Trinidadian grandmother and while they're in New York City and then gets all this extra cultural context. I I think that was, you know, well, not a dude did. I ain't got nothing but praises to sing to her. What, well, for y'all here, what is your relationship to your ancestors? What do you know about them? And I literally, before I got on here, just posted a video about toxic black mothers. Well, in this book, I was about to say, in this book, we don't even have any, we do. We have one toxic black mother, but that's another thing I loved about this book, that overall, we have a, a beautiful representation of black parents, especially black fathers in this book. We get a very positive representation between two different types of men. And, you know, this also honoring of your elders that happens. Um, but I got a facial like maybe a month or two ago and the esthetician when I was done was like, I felt your ancestor spirits when I was giving you your facial. And I was like, girl, you felt what? You felt mine? I mean, I do feel like I'm protected. I do feel like my woes and my hoes got me. But when I think about what, who in particular... I don't know. I feel like it, it has to be somebody that I never met. Like some wild, wild woman. Probably on my dad's side of the family. I don't know. But if anybody has a relationship to their ancestors, I would love to hear. Um, Moving along to the next question. Oh, Isabella says, I thought her dreaming of Queenie was a com confirmation, affirmation of Mabel and Audrey's love. They don't immediately tell each other they like each other, but Mabel isn't left wondering about Audrey's love. I, yeah, I think there was, there was so many notes that just hit in that dream sequence that Mabel experiences. And it does also, yeah, it also works as a vehicle to move the character along, to give her, to give the teenager within all her insecurities and all her unknowingness of, you know, still ex ex exploring, it definitely gives her the confidence, you know, to feel good about her attraction to Audrey and the beautiful love that just blossoms from yeah man at this point in the book I was crying on every page I was just a, a hot mess sobbing the whole second half of the book Audrey Jazzy and Ursa attend a prison meeting for the LGBTQIA plus students at their school the school also offers a course on Afrofuturistic feminisms in a poetry class that centers Black poets. Did you have any organizations, classes, or spaces that affirm your identities when you were younger? And if so, what were those spaces and how did you find them and what made you feel affirmed in that space? Okay, so Ashton's saying that they had a distant cousin of folklore from you heard Rhea, a distant cousin of a folklore of one of your ancestors who used his fiddle playing skills to escape slavery. Both my sister and I played the violin during our childhood. So IDK, if that's why me and my sister decided to play the violin, but I thought that was pretty interesting to learn. Yeah, you know, I definitely think that like, I, I don't think that I became who I became on my own or even just through the, the elders that I lived with and experienced firsthand. I do, you know, believe that I was in my grandmother's belly, right? And so I think there's, I mean, I grew up with my great grandmother on my mother's side. Um, and she was kind of a wild woman. Louise was. Uh, I actually know both of my great, well, not both, because you have, technically you have four great grandmothers. I know two of my four great grandmothers. Um, they just some spicy women. Something about that era of black women from the 1920s. They were spicy. Uh, but I definitely just, I mean, I also grew up with somebody who wasn't a relative, my Aunt Winnie. And when I think about who most of the elders that I knew would be most likely to protect me, for some reason, I just always think of her who would be surrounding me. My ancestors often visit me or my mom in dreams to alert us of someone possibly passing soon. It's scary, but also comforting. You know, I think I have to like open myself up. You know what I mean? I got to make room. I got to make room for the ancestors because I believe it's real. I do. Uh, did any of y'all have 
these organizations are classes that Audrey, Jazzy, and Ursa get to experience. I actually loved also that like these students in their educational process were reaffirmed by their teachers. I don't know that in high school, I was a theater kid. And I mean, I think I found solace in the community that I plucked from like theater and my AP classes and my peers there. But I don't think I had any space that really reaffirmed who I was. But, you know, I was a black girl in the 90s. Okay. I, you know, I was, I graduated high school in 2003. And so I, I, that was just a wildly different experience. Um, yeah. It was what it was. But I'm wondering, did anybody else have that sort of affirming experience? Um, from there. I wonder, is anybody watching on Facebook? Let me check because I only see YouTubers commenting and now I'm like, am I doing this correct? Oh no, we here. Y'all just quiet. All four of you are just real quiet right now. Okay. You could chime in too. In seventh grade, my black English teacher had us read Their Eyes Were Watching God and she started some heavy class discussions and I was sad that I didn't have the words to contribute, but I felt it. And you know what? That was one of the scenes that I also loved in the book that like, was it Mabel? I believe it was Mabel who didn't have the words. Well, I think Audrey also had this moment in the book where they didn't have the words to like, express. And because somehow as a teenager, as a child, we feel like we have to be wise and have all these, I mean, you, what point, do you, like, it, the, the process of coming into this language takes so much experience, and I think it's so interesting that we as teenagers are like, oh, I'm disappointed in myself because I don't know how to say what I feel, but it's like, give it time. You got time, babes. Oh, uh, I mean, I definitely read Toni Morrison in my English high school class, but I had a white English teacher, and um, that really had a lot to do with Oprah's book club. Because the book club in the early 2000s was hitting for Oprah. And she had Toni Morrison on the Oprah show quite a few times. And suddenly, Toni Morrison, who at that point had been on reading lists for quite a while, quite a few of my white women teachers were very invested in ensuring that Toni Morrison was read by the classroom. So, no, it didn't inspire deep conversation with my teacher. But I did read, I read Gloria Naylor. I read Bailey's Cafe and The Women of Rooster Place. And then I read Song of Solomon. And I think, and then I remember Paradise being on the book club list because my mom and my grandma would read all Oprah's books as well. And I remember my grandma reading Paradise. I said this before and she did not know. She finished the book and she's like, I just don't know. I'm, I'm unsure of myself here. But I feel like I read Paradise. I don't really remember it. In high school, I found the poetry community outside of school. I finally felt I found my people. Thank you, Danny, for chiming in here. Yeah, I think for most of us, especially those of us who are millennials, it's unlikely that we had like, I mean, I don't know, in the early 2000s, did did, did high schools have like black student unions or black, you know, like the black group? Most of us were like, if we could get into an arts program or an after school program, we were kind of finding some representation within that. I went to a predominantly white school. And so I didn't really have my black teachers who infer me. However, we did have a black student union. That's interesting. In high school? What year did you graduate? Mm. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question, but please, if you have any answers to the previous questions, you wanna talk about your ancestors or your experience with organizations and finding your community in school, go ahead. I'm just gonna go ahead and read the next question because I feel like with the stream, I'm like about 15 seconds ahead of everybody. Uh, okay, 2010 is when you graduated. All right, well, seven years after, I guess, you know, we're getting closer to the, uh, you know, BLM movement. It's post-Obama, right? Mm. I feel like had Obama been president already or while I was in high school, my high school experience would be radically different. But on page 24, the question is, in a public talk, Petrus Nasai, I got to look up how to pronounce their full last name since I'm doing the author chat with them next week, talks about how she came to include Mabel and Af 
Afua in the story. She says, the idea that came to my mind was that a kid who has this mysterious death possible illness intersects the person on death row and they are both black and something about the imminent death sentence brings them together. She even seems to juxtapose this moment when, am I pronouncing this correctly? Somebody got an A and help me out here. Afua's Afwa's inmate receives a lethal injection with the effects of chemotherapy in Mabel's body. Discuss your thoughts about Petrus's choice to juxtapose death row and terminal illness in the story. And why is it important for her to explore, explore black death in this way? Uh, okay. Oh yeah, I think that for most of us in the early 2000s, including you in 2010, that lumping all the black indigenous people of color <laughs> into extracurricular, or extracurricular groups into one is kind of standard. Mm -mm. I thought it was interesting that she juxtaposed Mabel's, you know, fatal illness with Afwa's death sentence because I think Afwa definitely provides the levity about how to confront grief. And I really think this book is a great exploration into grief because I firmly believe this pandemic has absolutely highlighted for me how we as Americans don't have any cultural practices around grief. Grief is something you take a day. Maybe if you're lucky, you take a week off and then you pile through and you come right back to it. And this book also kind of hits on that note of like, you know, pending. I just watched Swan Song, oh, Marshala Ali's movie, man. And that also deals with grief and death. But I think the, the sort of levity that Afua provides in... You know, how long it's been since he's seen outside and that, you know, he had to reshift his thinking because he was caged and be able to live life while he had that possibility and also be okay with the fact that his ending was not his choice because he couldn't allow that to eat him up. And Mabel threw him and through her letters to him becoming okay with the way her childhood was unfairly going to come to an end. And then being able to invest in the loving relationships that her friends and family were surrounding her with. I mean, I also love how gracefully the book ended because it's like, well, did we take it as death? Hmm. I don't know. It was magical. It, I mean, Winata definitely reframes an experience that many of us are taught to fear as a, a possibly magical experience. I think we're used to death being a solo act and very lonely when you know that it's approaching. It was sort of calming that Mabel and Afua had each other. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it provided like this level of peace because I was crying the whole book like, oh, there's so much love. And, you know, don't nobody wants to read about like a young child losing their life early. But there was... I, I, think, I think back to cultures that have a communal practice around death and how, you know, we are a very individualistic society, capitalism, you know, capitalism going to capitalize. Uh, American society is very much so centered around the individual. But that idea that, like, the, the process that they were going through is supported by the community that's around them. And it kind of transforms the experience. It it gives it, an, and they give each other this essence of magic, of mysticism, a mystical presence that I really enjoyed. Oh. More y'all need to join in on these live discussions because this book was good. I don't know why y'all not here with me. It was good as hell. How does care work shape Audrey and Mabel's relationship? How does Audrey caring for Mabel broaden our understanding of who? can practice care work. Um, 
Audrey in that call in part one with her grandmother where she is stressing and, you know, she thinks that her grandmother is queenie, is like literally the queen of her life, all mystical, all knowing being. And when queenie keeps it real with her, like, first of all, you know, you, you pull this out of you. Like I've already passed this on to you. It's all within you, but you have to, you have to, well, what did she say to, um, Audrey? Was it that she has to learn or she has to give, gain confidence and practice and also believe in the power of herself before she can do anything spiritual or mystical for somebody else? But I loved, absolutely loved that like Mabel's parents were willing to not let another young child into their home and allow her to take on this caring practice. It was so beautiful. Uh, their relationship, I think you're referring to Afwa and Mabel, allowed, aided them in both seeing that they can, what they can be beyond death. For our culture, death is so final, but they get to explore what can happen as an ancestor or part of the stars. I mean, that really is the idea of the title of the book, right? The stars and the blackness between them. <clears throat> You know, death is not your final story and your presence on earth does not cease just because your physical being is gone. I love this book so much. Spirituality plays a huge role in both Audrey and Mabel's healing and coping processes. What kind of spiritual or and or healing practices do you have or have you considered using? Have you ever used these practices in addition to or as alternatives to conventional medicine? Let me know. I feel like so many of us have gotten back into healing ourselves and giving grace to our body. You know, I definitely, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a crystal and fenugreek girl. You know what I mean? I got crystals in the house. I got a little sage in the house too. I do, but I believe, I believe. I take my vitamins. I also go to the doctor when need be. You know, I like to strike a nice balance with all these things. But I, you know, I love Trini food. It is one of my favorite cuisines. And when they were talking about the veganism, and I feel like they even mentioned like Ital and that sort of raw eating. I'm not, I'm not too keen on like soul food or American style vegan food even. Now I'll eat, I'll go to a soul food vegan restaurant, but I just feel like it always be, it's still heavy. It's still heavy, but I love a Trini or even Jamaican. I know those are two different cultures, but um, a Trini or Jamaican sort of vegan food because it's not, I don't like this idea of veganism being so reliant on replicating the meat products. Like just make some new, just make some, I, me too. I love a pilori. I love a doubles. Yes. Tamarind and pepper sauce me down, please. China, yeah, I'm there with you. Just, just make the food. I don't, I don't need it to taste like mac and cheese. It's never going to. Please, it's either the texture feels like sawdust or something grimy up in there. I don't need it. I just want, I want you to make the food that you're making without it trying to replicate something. And so that's why I tend to like Caribbean style vegan food. And I love that through Audrey's cousin, we get an exploration of that. And then she calls her cousin and gets all his recipes and starts making all these things for Audrey to help, hopefully to help her feel better. Oh, that's so wonderful. What culture? Is your family from that your parents had an ancestor altar and every Sunday we try to care for the altar so that you would buy flowers, refresh the water and clean the altar. I mean, when I lived in Brooklyn, I remember at one point, quite a few of my peoples was into Santa, San, Santeria. I didn't get into it because I had a homeboy who grew up in the religion and he was like, I remember him making this comment about like, he found, he found it interesting how it was becoming like the hip thing to do, but having grown up in the religion as a child, he found it um, a little suffocating. And I was like, yeah, you know, if I'm not going to do a full deep dive, I think I, 
I'm not going to just take on things. You know, like the Orishas and the Oshun things are becoming real popular again. Uh, okay, this makes sense. My father practices the Yoruba tradition. I love people getting back to their indigenous roots. That was something I was thinking about in the recent video I just posted about toxic mothers because, you know, I'm, I'm an American history student. And so now I talk about everything. Everything got to have a history context to it now for me. And I talk about everything from like an American history perspective. But I was thinking, you know, within the diaspora, and I almost even imagine that most people that were asking me to talk about toxic black mothers were more likely than not to have mothers that were from the diaspora, diaspora. And I was just thinking about like how Christianity, because one of the books that I read in class Wicked Flesh was a study between um, Barbados, New Orleans, and Senegambia, which is the coast of West Africa. And most of the books that I've been reading on like black womanhood and the history of motherhood and stuff all make this comment that prior to the Europeans showing up on the shores of West Africa, that indigenous West African cultures prior to like Christianity becoming a thing in mass did not have Western gender identities that there was more of a communal setting that really honored the ancestor and also honored that individuals inherited, not based on their gender, but based on their personhood, that they inherited certain roles in the community. You know, and so I was just thinking about like how, like a lot of, about reframing, you know, ethnic traditions as pagan really kind of got us lost in the sauce. So I appreciate people that really honor their ethnicity. Ooh, what, Danny, what kind of altar did your great grandmother keep? You know, my family's Jehovah's Witness. And then before Jehovah's Witness, they were Catholic. Catholics have altars though, I feel like. Yes, Ken. I want to turn off the sound. If you hear Discord going off in the back, I don't even have the tab open. It just be making the sound all day of the long. You hear it? I hear it. I'm about to just put my computer on do not disturb because this is very annoying. You know what it is maybe? Mm, I thought it might be in my notifications, but it's not. Okay, whatever. We'll let it go. It's just in the background. I, too, love looking at pictures of my ancestors. I have so many black and white pictures. I actually need to hang up the pictures of my house. <sighs> Y'all have to put me on to some practices. You know, when I did my ancestry DNA, well, I've done all the genealogy websites, but it turns out that I found an African relative. We are, him and my father are like fourth cousins. They're separated by four generations. Yes, he's Nigerian, but they're E-F-I-K, ethic. Maybe I could look into it. My homeboy invited me to go to Nigeria and the, the, the family that I connected to that's African, part of them do still live in, um, is it Calabar? Yeah, somewhere over there. You know what I mean? Maybe one day I'll make my way. I'm making my way downtown on a long-ass flight to Nigeria. <laughs> Maybe I will. Let's get back into these questions, though. After reading Afwa's mem memoir and receiving his letter, Mabel begins to study astrology. Are you interested in astrology? Ah, you know, you know, you know I am. What role, if any, does astrology play in your life? And do you know your astrological sign and the meaning of your various signs? In what way, if any, has it helped you find meaning or connect with others? So if you are a longtime subscriber to my YouTube channel, I have a video with my astrologer, Sam. And we talk about my birth chart. And Sam has really just put me on to so much when it comes to astrology. He's also like really kind of honed in on 
not abusing your sun sign because he's like that's just a form of commercialism of people being told that like they can really learn about themselves simply based on their sun sign you have a whole composite in your chart and it doesn't necessarily predict things in your life but it does kind of it, like it's a way to like understand yourself better a way to help you make better decisions and also be kinder to yourself I don't use astrology to, pre to predict anything but you know I do be leaning on the fact that I have a Taurus moon that's why I'm always late and I have a Gemini rising which is why I talk so much and I'm an Aries sun I love it I highly encourage anyone who knows their main houses which means you have the time of your birth but you have don't know what it means to get a reading get a reading uh my astrologer is sam reynolds unlock astrology then also i like oh man i did an astrology reading with janelle j so above j so above on twitter and i think she's awesome but i would highly recommend even if you're reading an app and you're just reading the individual elements of your birth chart to get a reading because it's so in-depth there's there's trines and conjunctions that you're this degree that and you you know I was born on the first day of Mercury and retrograde at one degree Gemini so like I'm very much so ruled by Mercury like I'm a mess actually but um no I'm not my astrologer says I have a birth chart very similar to Maya Angelou which I I think is hilarious hilarious Mabel writes to Afwa after reading his memoir. Afwa is on death row for killing a cop and his best friend, James, a crime he didn't commit. Is there a person whose story has served as a tool for your healing? Have you reached out or considered reaching out to them to explain their role in your healing journey? And what did or would you say? Well, I, I that's why I like doing these author chats. You know, I think we've had some really, really good author chats that that books that really put me on you know uh, pleasure activism adrian marie brown we sat down with them um ksa layman for heavy uh wish tony morrison was still alive and we had a chance you know had a chance had a chance so many books i'm trying to think of their individual i that i've ever reached out to to be like you know you changed my life You know, hmm. if anyone's reached out to someone that's been influential to them, I would love to hear it. I don't know that I have a personal experience in that one. What is your reaction to the ending for Mabel and Afwa? Go back and reread the prologue. How does this prologue foreshadow what inevitably, ha what inevitably happens to Mabel and Afwa at the end? Were you expecting different outcomes? Let's go back and reread the prologue together we outsmarted oblivion seven times in a row and made it look like jazz with no chains like shaking our butt with no shame we moonwalked past the ghosts of this living world we decided to free ourselves out of the estranged strangling of this reality we swan dived and centered in our magic we found an eternal life that couldn't understand prisons or any other enslavement we was not at the frequency that could catch or contort our souls. It wasn't easy, but destiny is destiny. Our bodies levitated by the stardust of the ancestors in our bones. Our ecstasy got divined in limitless, in limitless existence. This is how we figured it out. Heard on the echo of a breeze in a playground somewhere in the future where kids are feeling free and they are double dutch and singing, gardening, and twerking in the radiance of their ancestors' laughter. I just love that Winata was bold enough to write this book. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Man, you know what I mean? Aw, thank you for the compliment. I feel like this is definitely Danny commenting. <laughs> Here, uh, let me check before I make wild assumptions. But uh, I think the book title and the prologue definitely made, yeah, I was right, <laughs> made made sense of like 
the ending, right? Even though the, I think the ending isn't meant to be like specific. I think it's meant for you to interpret it however you interpret it. But that like, they become limitless. They become the stars. It's like, okay. Like this all made sense. And I like Mabel don't have the words to like <laughs> express exactly how this made sense. But I I don't know that I expected her death, but I I didn't expect her death in that frame, right? I just think it, the book just ended, like, you know, sometimes you get to the end of the book and you feel like the ending was rushed and it just wraps up because at this point the book needs to wrap up. But I felt like this was a very well thought out ending. Wonderful. In a public talk, Petrus says that she wrote this book as a love letter to Minneapolis. Many mainstream queer stories are often told from perspectives of queer people living in coastal and metropolitan areas of cities. Likewise, we rarely consider queer representations and stories taking place in West Indian and Caribbean contexts. Why do you think it's important for a story about Black queer love and queer families to take place in a Midwestern city and West Indian or Caribbean communities? I... Love that because, you know, one of the models of the book club is for the black girl in the forgotten spaces. And I do dislike how often representation, especially of black women, and as the syllabus suggests of black queer people, is centered on, you know, New York, Atlanta, LA, sometimes we get Chicago. And, you know, now it's, it, we might get some mysticism out the Carolinas, but they always on the beach. You know what I mean? They always live on the coastline. And, you know, aside from like Toni Morrison, who really, she's from Ohio. So most all her books are centered in black folks in Ohio, giving a shout out to black folks who live in the Midwest. I loved getting this kind of split between Minneapolis and Trinidad without making Trinidad out to be this flatly mystical place where all things are good and Minneapolis made out to be like all oh, drive America, but that there was a love and a bonding and a beautifulness and a mysticalness between both towns or both, you know, one's a country because what city is she from in Trinidad? I forget. Oh, Leventhal? She from the hood in Trinidad. Um, but from where Audrey is from in Trinidad and between Minneapolis, I definitely felt the love heavy. And it was just, ah. Okay, bringing it back to Neri. We, this is the, I think, is this like one of the only questions about Neri in the syllabus? We learned that Neri has found a queer community back home in Trinidad. It actually got to come back to Trinidad because she was shipped off to Tobago. Why was it important that we learned about what happens to Neri once Audrey leaves? And I think it's important because it's also understood. It's not like Audrey abandoned her love for Neri, right? That like, or that Neri abandoned her love for Audrey because there was that kind of line walked at the beginning of the book about Audrey when they were found, Audrey kind of leaning into the Christian rhetoric and feeling like, you know, she deserved the punishment. But that she was finding a home amongst a chosen family in Trinidad and that we knew that she was safe and that it wasn't, and that the connection and that message came through Queenie, Queenie, Audrey's grandmother, meant that that connection was not lost and that that love could exist with Audrey as well as her love for Mabel. I just thought it, it just made, it made the book so whole. I appreciate it. Audrey's dad, I think this is the last question in the book, in the syllabus. Audrey's dad tells her that she is named after the black lesbian feminist poet, Audrey Lord. He reveals that he wanted to name her Audrey after reading a quote from Lord that says, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crushed into other people's fantasies of me and eaten alive. He goes on to say that he always wanted Audrey to be free to be herself in ways that he was not allowed to be as a young person. What is the meaning behind your name and how has it helped you define you? I am named after an Isley Brothers version of 
some white boys. What's the white boy's name? Hold on. Seals and Croft. That's what I'm named after. That's it. What does it mean to me? I actually love my name. I love my whole name. My parents ate. You know, I'm not going to tell you my whole name, but my parents slapped. They did that. I, I appreciate it. My sister's the one that got stuck with the black girl middle name of Nicole. Not me, though. <laughs> I got some ingenuity there, okay? And it it's always made me feel, like, special. It makes me feel like I am the person that I am. You know what I mean? Like, I love my name. It would be upsetting to the readers to not know the outcome or safety of a child. Yeah, I feel like every character in this book was given lots of care including Audrey's mother because we even got a little bit of her backstory it was just so well done all right so in the syllabus let's see if I can share my screen let me close out some of my work tabs here I have a lot going on because a bitch be working you hear me oh and the look it still goes to my Work screen. Okay. So in the syllabus here, we have the, Denisha created a playlist. Now at the end of this book and the stars and the blackness between them, there is a playlist that Winata has. You can actually find it on Spotify. Um, and you, if you get the syllabus, you can click through here. It'll open on Spotify. And she had, Denisha put in a playlist. And then also you can in, ask that you include a playlist of songs that you felt there were a lot of musical themes throughout the the book and I think Denisha did a w wonderful job Missy Elliott for featuring genuine and tweet takeaway oh man I'm gonna have to definitely listen to this while I work out I'm gonna work out after this Esperanza Spalding Black Gold oh this is such a beautiful playlist definitely gonna get into this Ah, I can't wait to listen. Okay, is this Abby saying that, well, your name is Hi Abby in the Facebook group, so I apologize. Give us your first name, love. Saying my full name may, name means we asked for her and behold, she is ours. Mine makes me feel special also. I guess it makes me feel like I have a purpose. Yeah, I love it. I love it, Absolutely. Ashton, you're named after the computer software my mom used at her job. She wanted me to have a unisex white sounding name so I would have a better chance for college applications. I would like to offer a formal apology to all, all, all the black people who had parents of the 80s and 90s who fed into this belief that white sounding names were gonna save their children. They didn't know that technology was coming to find you hoes. Is, I thought a Benny, is a Benny a Ghanaian name? I think that's a really pretty name though. My name, my middle name is Queen in Spanish, but pronounced Renee. It makes me feel royal. Now I gotta look up how to say, how to say Queen in Spanish. Oh, Reina, but you Renee, Reina, Renee, Renee, okay. My name means worthy of love according to the aunt who chose it and delightfully comes in clutch when I'm fighting my imposter syndrome. You know, I've definitely thought about children's names and looking at my family um, tree. I have, there was one name in, oh, okay, it's a Benny is Yorba also. Thank you. I was thinking of, what was the name on my dad's side of the family? Onaya? Onia? Tree. Let's search. Okay. I have an aunt named Louisiana and I thought that was a very cool name. 
Oh no, not your friend still using the white naming system. Did it help them out though? I don't know. I'm giving, I told my mom names that I would want to give my children. And she's like, why should I give your children slave names? <laughs> yeah, Hezekiah, my nigga. I didn't even go to church. I, that's not the name I told her, but I like old black names. A lot of Charlottes in my family, but that's just because, you know, five generations ago, there was a woman named Charlotte. We have an India. Well, where is this lady at? Oh, Onida. O-N-E-I-D. Oh, Onida. Yeah, I believe this is Onida. That's how you say it. Onita, but then somehow, you know, she was born in 1880. Somehow her name gets changed to Annette. But I like that it was several generations of Onitas in my family. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to repurpose that because I like that. But I, I definitely... Um, will be giving my children names that they can be proud of. Oh, well, I hope that they'll be proud of. But names with meanings, essentially. Because I like that cultural, even if it's an honorific name, I like the cultural implications of names meaning things and not just being names because, like, you want to feed into an American system. No Johns. Sorry. No Michaels. Sorry, no Jessicas or Nicoles on this side of the fence, all right? Okay, that is it for this discussion. Don't forget, next week we have, I was like, oh, why is my why am I so red? It's because my screen is red here. Um, but we have Wanada, the author of The Stars and the Blackness Between Them, joining us next week. Please submit your questions. Matter of fact, let me look at the form before I log off here so I can see, have we gotten any questions? All right, gonna sh share my screen again. You see it's blank here. Let's put it up. All right, here is, okay, we got two responses. You do not have to put your name in. Don't worry, we don't really mention names during the interview, but you can submit up to three questions. You can submit as many times as you want. Please send your questions. And this is a great read. And we're really excited to have Winata sit down with us. You know, she's currently on hiatus because she's working on her next piece of literature. And so her sitting down with us and giving her, our, giving her, giving us her time is really, really valuable. And so we really want to be able to show up and show out. So please submit your question. All righty. All right. Thank y'all for joining in and everyone have a good evening. See y'all next Thursday at 6 p.m. for the author chat. Bye.